morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, you can hear me properly, right? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay, good. Hmm. So, uh, you can see me also. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can see you also. So, how do I? I mean, so you are start the presentation when I do. Uh, so I think you have to share the screen. There is one icon, green icon. I think you are able to see that. Right now, yeah, I'm sure I'll find it. Yes, sir. But right now I can't see it. So it is in the uh, like down of the screen. You can see. One minute, let's see. There are some options like. Yeah, there's a share screen icon, yes, right? Sir. Yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, first, please open that PDF for the PPT, sir, yeah. and keep it in the desktop. Yeah. And then share. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me do that right away. Huh? Yes, sir. If I want to do a full screen, I can do it, right? And uh, yes, I just yes, have sir. to use arrows on my keyboard to change. Uh, no, sir, you can use the full screen. No, but when I use the full screen to go on to the next slide. Yeah, you can use the arrows, sir. It will I work can out. use my arrows, right? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. You can use the arrows. Okay. Let's see. But if I use the full screen, I will be seen a little bit, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so now I've put it on my. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. We can. Okay, so let me just do that arrow once up and down and yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please, sir. Doesn't seem to work. One moment. So I'll have to try the page down. Okay, page down. Okay. That doesn't work either. One moment. Let me let me stop the share for a while and come back. Hmm. Yeah. So with the mouse, uh, you try. I don't have, I mean, I don't have a mouse. I've got oh, a, okay, okay. Okay, something happened. One moment. Yeah. You could see the next screen, right? Yeah. Please share it, sir. We are not able to see your screen. Okay, okay. One moment. Let's see. Is it PPT, sir? It is PPT, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so, let's try now. Let, let me share now. First, uh, share your screen, then share slide, then you can do yeah, a let's see what happens now. Hmm. Yeah. Now, this I, I could actually do this, right? I could always do this. Yeah, you're on slide three, but you can go full screen. So now I've gone to slide one. I think it's now, okay. I think there's now enough you're, back, you're back to slide one, but I believe you certainly can go to the full screen and still do the same. Yeah, but I think if it's if it's big enough, I prefer this because if yeah. I need to go back and forth, I have some ready reference. Sure. Right. Yes, yes, sir. I okay. This will work. No. Yeah, this is fine. This is large enough. Yes, I thought so. Yes. Okay. So do we start or do we wait for a while? Uh, we can we can just start. Soon. No, it's okay. You tell me. I mean, <laughs> if you are expecting more people to join, I could wait for a while. Uh, like some students are there in the class, they'll be joining back to the class. So I think for two minutes we can wait. Okay, okay. Uh, how are you, Shinya? Shiva, sir. Sir, yes. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. So actually, we have our faculties uh, from Department of Mathematics. I am Dr. Abeda Dudmani from the Mathematics Department. Okay. And uh, my uh, work specialization is topology and fuzzy logic. And okay. I think uh, some more uh, faculties are here. Um, I request Mahalakshmi ma'am to introduce yourself. Sir, good morning. This is Dr. Mahalakshmi from Department of Mathematics and Sagar University. Uh, so we are very privileged to have you here. So in this juncture, I want to thank Banga sir to bring you here. Uh, very thank you, sir. Accept ah. our invitation in your busy schedule and uh, uh, 
agreed to deliver a talk on this exciting topic mathematical modeling in sport so so many students were and especially you mentioned about cricket yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it sir. will be a lot about cricket so yeah, yeah, sure. i'm not cheating anyone yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir thank you very much okay uh, i thank you ma'am anuradha ma'am Well, yeah, I think I can unmute myself now. I was not able to unmute actually. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. Yeah, I'm Dr. Anuradha Bhattacharji from the Mathematics Department. So I've been working on mathematical modeling of infectious diseases. So that has been the area of uh, PhD. So I think uh, this would be rather fascinating for me to see how it will be applied in sports actually, sir. Okay. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Anuradha ma'am. And here we have uh, Dr. Deepika T. Or one more faculty. Hi, sir. Very good morning, morning sir. Good morning. Hmm. I'm Dr. Deepika T. I'm from Department of Mathematics. Okay. Uh, so currently I'm working on discrete mathematics in the chemical graph theory. Okay, chemical okay. graphs. Okay. Yes, huh. sir. Yes, sir. Long, long, long ago, I did my PhD in graph theory. Okay. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. wow. That's very really, uh, great to hear, sir. Yeah, but I must have forgotten. Mm. Okay. I did my PhD in Ballari University, sir, Vijayanagara Sri Krishna Devara the Krish, Devara University. Okay. And my guide is uh, Dr. V. Lokesh. I'm sure I don't know him because I, yeah. okay. I, wasn't, I wasn't in academics. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Deepika. Uh, Thank you. Sir, so, so, uh, one, uh, one or two more colleagues are in a class. So uh, I think uh, 160 participants have joined here uh, with the permission of uh, Deshmukh sir, Dean sir, and uh, Dr. Dean Research. So we can just start the session, sir. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, so formally, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. The famous saying by Albert Einstein, with this quote, a very good and warm uh, morning to everyone. Well. Uh, well, welcome you all to the DSU organized the National Mathematics Day 2020 Talk 3 in, in that is Mathematical Modeling in Sports by Dr. Srinivas Bogle in association with Karnataka State Council for Science and Technology. I take this opportunity to heartily welcome our today's speaker, Dr. Srinivas Bogle, honorary scientist, CSIR, Fort Padigam Institute, India. Welcome you, sir. Thank you. Hmm. Also, it's my honor to welcome our beloved Dean Sir, Dr. A. Srinivasa, Dr. P. C. Deshmukh Sir, Dr. M. K. Banga Sir to this event. Welcome, Sir. Lastly, I welcome all the dear participants and my dear uh, colleagues to this event. Welcome you all. Now, it's time to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Srinivas Bogle, who needs no introduction. Yet, I try my level best to do it. Please excuse me, Sir, if I commit any error. Dr. Srinivas Bogli is an honorary scientist at CSIR, Fourth Paragon Institute, India. He was earlier the actor of uh, uh, TEOCO, Software Private Limited. He was a vice president analytics at Crane Software International Limited. And for a long time, 20 plus years, headed the information management division at National Aerospace Laboratories, Bangalore. Sir so obtained his PhD in 1983 from the University of Paris B for a thesis on hypergraphs and information theory. And he's BSTAT honors and MSTAT honors from the Indian, Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, respectively in 1977 and 1978. At NAL, National Aerospace Laboratories, Sir functioned in the role of a CIO, working extremely on an information portal and the development of knowledge products, both in analytics and aerospace. Sir has taught courses in probability statistics and information management at Bangalore, in Bangalore University, Indian Statistical Institute, and Indian uh, Institute of Bio uh, Bioinformatics and Applied Biotechnology, IBAB, and is a popular speaker and a columnist. Sir has also guided over 200 student projects in database design and information systems, and is the author of about 75 published articles, reviews, and reports. His experience include monsoon rainfall prediction using data intensive techniques, Sir teach courses in big data analysis in St. Joseph College, 
sir is partner in project of blog and write a book on agile software development sir is a management consultant speaker and a storyteller on how to build and use informatic systems and on and on so finally the counts go on so ladies and gentlemen here with i'm presenting dr shrinivas bhogle it will be an honor to have you sir with us today thank you sir so and, and now yeah. may i request dr shrinivas bhogle sir to take over the session okay thank you yeah it's a joy i hope you can see the full slide yes sir we are able Including to your college logo at the bottom right along with ksc yes sir yes sir yes sir both are visible a little while ago it was uh, too enlarged yeah all right so yeah this is 90 minutes right so we start 10 seven so about 11:30 ish i need to stop yeah please go ahead sir. all right okay so the title is mathematical modeling in sport now i must admit that it's a little bit of a it's a little bit forced because you have this seminar series on mathematical modeling so i thought we need to have that word inside and in a sense it's not wrong at all because you know there's always a little bit of a confusion about what constitutes uh, mathematics and what constitutes statistics especially in our curriculum because we seem to treat them as separate subjects either i'm doing something in bsc in maths or something or i'm doing something in statistics the truth of the matter is that uh, they're practically indistinguishable uh, to do anything worthwhile in statistics you actually have to fall back on uh, mathematical models a lot of uh, for example uh, well we'll we'll look at some examples so i do want to say that even though this might look more like statistics as is understood in uh, the popular thought today it is mathematical modeling okay mathematical modeling in sport yeah i just said sport because i thought it makes it a little more general but the truth of the matter is that in india especially sport is almost cricket so you will see that bias in the talk as well i will talk a little bit about you know i have a slide about other sports but that's just to make sure that i am faithful to my lecture title but otherwise it will be quite a lot in fact almost everything about cricket so if you are cricket lovers uh, settle down okay yeah let me go on to the next slide okay so this is this is going to be the course of today's presentation uh, you know these are the themes that i'm going to be talking about uh, you'll explicitly see more discussion about them as we go along so i the first slide is really dedicated to other sports so by other sports i really mean uh, just just as mention about tennis and football then i ask a series of questions but how do we rank cricket teams can we do better how do we rank players you know team is one thing players is one thing so how do we rank them another more interesting question how do we value cricketers now valuing a cricketer today is something different from what it was say 15 years ago or you value the cricketer if he won matches for you or if he drew them for you like uh, vihari and ashwin yesterday but today it's changed see when you with the coming of ipl in particular and with the coming of much more cricket much more money in cricket so when we say how should we value cricketers it, it it's it's a much bigger question and indeed it needs some significant mathematical modeling if if you want to reach a reasonably correct answer then i have this intriguing question about did tendulkar really let down the indian cricket team of course he's retired now he's retired for couple, many years now 6 7 years but every time india didn't do well or every time india did lost a match people tended to blame tendulkar so it's because tendulkar got out early that you know things like that so this uh, it's not going to be a cricketing discussion because it's not a cricketing talk in that sense so this is going to be about ideas from the base theorem i suppose uh, most of you who do probability statistics mathematics in college have heard of the base theorem i'd like to believe that uh, i'd like to hope that many of you really understood the uh, principle and the idea behind base theorem Uh, although i suspect that many don't so we'll have we'll take a shot at that and then i'll come on to the 
the core of the lecture where I talk about the Duckworth-Lewis, nowadays it's called the Duckworth-Lewis-Stern method. You know, for whenever a match, a limited overs match is affected by rain or any other interruption. But these are matches that require a result. I mean, you can't have a draw in a ODI or in a T20. So how do we decide who won? So that's where the Duckworth-Lewis method, as it used to be called, and now it's called the Duckworth-Lewis-Stern method. That's where it comes into being. And that is truly mathematical modeling. So we'll talk about that. Talk about another intriguing idea that we have called the idea of a pressure index, or we want to call it pulse, which is again mathematical modeling. Incidentally, the slide I'm going to talk about is some work done by a friend of mine, who's also the director of the Chennai Mathematical Institute. His name is Dr. Rajiv Karandikar. And then some intriguing but truthful questions. Are we really going to need umpires in the future? Uh, my answer is no, uh, but you'll have to wait and see. And all of you are pretty young, so you'll, you'll be around when you see that the umpire will be either a joker or non-existent. And finally, are we ready for cricket learning? You know, we talk of machine learning, we talk of artificial intelligence, all the stuff, you know, everyone's into that these days. So I've coined this term called machine, you know, take off from machine learning, I talk of cricket learning. It's just a mention, it's, it's not a big deal, it's just a mention. Okay, so that's going to be the course. I, I'll need to go pretty fast because otherwise I can't finish and I do want to finish. Uh, so occasionally, if you don't understand everything, well, you can ask me later in the question answer or you can email me and I will certainly send you the answers. Or if you're that excited, we could have a private call, you know, on Zoom or something. Okay. All right, so what is money ball? You know, one of the difficulties I have is that uh, I presume there are quite a few of you listening to me, but I can't look at you. And uh, as all teachers here, I realize that I realize there are a lot of professional teachers listening to this. So you will realize that the interactivity that we have in a classroom is missing. The eye contact is missing. Uh, the connect in some sense is missing. And because of that, you know, I can't ask you a question like we often do in a class. I would have asked you, do you know what is money ball? And somebody in the class would have said, yes, we know. Uh, here in principle, it's possible, but uh, not so easy. So let me still ask the question and presume that I can't hear your answer. So let me talk to you about it. Uh, Moneyball, some of you must have heard about it. I think it was a book that was published around, you know, 2005 maybe. I think somebody called Lewis published that book. And if you see that slide on top, if we win on our budget with this team, we'll have changed the game. So he's really talking about baseball. Uh, and the real idea is that, you know, and we see that happening in IPL as well. We see it all in happening in you know, any tournament in the English Premier League, for example, or La Liga, anywhere. So if you want to play well, if you want to win tournaments, if you want to sort of succeed big time, uh, the popular, I, I might say the only strategy seems to be to buy good players. And to buy good players, you have to pay a lot of money. So eventually the problem boils down to you spend a lot of money and then you get a great team. If you see that in football, you'll see that teams like, uh, well, Chelsea uh, 10, 15 years ago, or more recently, Manchester City. There's usually, usually a sheikh somewhere who has a lot of money or there's a Russian billionaire somewhere who has a lot of money. So he decides to invest his money in football teams because uh, even if it doesn't give him back returns directly, it gives him a lot of visibility. You know, it's good for him in other ways. If he has runs other businesses, it's good for him. I mean, even in India, if you think of Chennai Super Kings, I don't know if N. Srinivasan makes money on Chennai Super Kings, but Indian Cements, his company, surely made a lot of money. All right, so the point is most people think that you want to win, you want to win big tournaments, pay more. So Moneyball was, it was a very interesting exercise on optimization. So they say that to win a match, and that's true in IPL and increasingly people talk about that. It's not that you need the best 11 players. It's you need, it's that you need the best team. So, you know, if you have a team with, uh, let's say, you know, one massive hitter, you may not need another one. Something that say Kings 11 Punjab goes wrong. You know, they pack themselves with a lot of hitters. And uh, so it's really not a player that makes a team. You know, it's, it's the entire composition of the team. 
so how do i make that level that gels best together it's even more so in football i mean in football it's it's much more a team game it's much more combination among each other it's about passes it's not like cricket where it's 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 a much more selfish game cricket there's a bowler who's doing his stuff there's a batsman who's facing it and the fielders often have to take catches so it's it's classically a analytics problem that's what we call it today maybe 10 15 years ago you'd call it a classic or problem an operations research problem so the or problem the formulation of that problem would be how do i win tournaments spending the least amount of money so minimize cost given the major constraint that i have to win the tournament or win individual matches and that's what moneyball was about and this argued that really what you need is uh, you know you need combinations you need associations and this player plays well with the other player maybe one of the player is much better than the other but two of them together uh, really are a far better combination so you put together a team like that you know you choose the best team which links the best with one another which has the best coordination among themselves you know which each of the player brings the strongest dose of focus of his top skill and that top skill you know merges very well with the other person's top skill but you know people get paid if they have a multiple of skills so if you just have one top skill your price is not so much see if in cricket you got somebody who can bowl bouncers you know or bowl yorkers but can't field or can't bat uh, he's not so valuable he is valuable but only to the extent that he can bowl very well so what would i do i would complement him with someone who can bat very well and these two together might cost you less than you know two giants okay that's the idea uh, i don't really have time to talk more about it but you get the idea it's a classic optimization problem which is mathematical if anything else because you have an objective function and you want to serve this thing and then you model that function and then you do what your maximum minima you do your partial derivatives you do what it takes uh, to reach optimization okay so that was what it, moneyball incidentally was in baseball Uh, but uh, the principles in moneyball uh, can really be used in any team sport in fact people are already talking of say cricket ball and you know things like that just copying and there was a film made on moneyball uh, which sold rather well so that's you know th- that's how it happens you write a great book you make a great movie out of it and then ideas catch on okay next and quickly again is an example from tennis you watch tennis uh, i suppose everyone watches uh, wimbledon and the uh, us open and so on now here were a group of mathematicians you know when you watch tennis you know, in particular this study was about wimbledon so when you watch tennis you have these commentators and often it happens in cricket as well you have commentators will tell you oh it's an advantage to serve first in a set or new balls are an advantage a player is as good as his or her first or second serve So you realize these are typical tennis statements that people make, and if we trust the commentator, we kind of accept it on faith. Uh, sometimes we are not so sure, uh, but there is no way to verify. So you know, you let it be. You say, "I think he got it wrong," or you might say, "I think he got it very right." Uh, the fact is, how do we, how do we actually decide whether they got it right or not? How do we evaluate that statement? If someone says that new balls are an advantage to the server, how do you prove it? How do we establish it? So this is where we have uh, ideas from. You know, these are at core mathematical ideas. These are modeling ideas, and this is an idea of what in statistics people call testing of hypothesis. Those of you who learned or are teaching or learning statistics would have heard about testing of hypothesis, and I fear. that you might have heard of it in uh, you know sort of the most mechanical sense it's almost like you know there's a chapter in a book you got to read it up and you got to mug up parts of it uh, there's going to be a question in the exam about testing a hypothesis and you somehow have to answer that you know that's very sad it's very sad but that's how a lot of us are teaching a lot of subjects and that's going to change and i think with you know with more of the audio visual element coming in it's going to change whatever you see a teacher on a blackboard with his back facing the students how much can he communicate 
So this is going to change. But the way to do it in statistics is to test hypothesis. And testing a hypothesis involves formulating what you call a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis and then rejecting a hypothesis. Okay, you've probably heard these terms, you've probably not heard these terms. But the idea is very simple. Uh, the core mathematical idea is that, uh, okay, let me give me a, give you a quick another, another example. It's not from sport, but it, let's say that I want to decide whether I'm hypertensive or not. Uh, do I suffer from blood pressure? Now, how do I answer that question? I can take my measurement right now and it can turn out that my measurement is a little, my systolic and diastolic is a little more than the average. I'm a little more than the average. So at this point of time, you know, I am somewhat hypertensive. Uh, but does it mean that I have the affliction? Does it mean that I have the disease? It may not be, it may just be that I climbed three floors or it might be that I was rushing to class because I was late and the teacher punishes me. It could be anything. So really one observation is not enough. If I were to measure myself on 100 different days and on each of these 100 days or most of these, each of these 100 days, I find that uh, I'm above normal, then you would agree that it is very fair to conclude that I'm indeed hypertensive and I need to get onto some medication. Because what's the argument there? The argument is that, look, I measured you 100 times and on each of these 100 times, you are above average. It's not like 50 times you are above average and 50 times you are not. Each of the 100 times I was above average. All right, now suppose I measure you and I find that uh, 95 times you are above average and five times you are not above average. And I ask you, in this scenario, uh, is it correct to say that I am hypertensive? And so, well, five times you are average, 95 times you are not. Uh, five is still, uh, there were five readings when you are not, but they are overwhelmed by these 95 readings which say that you were. So the probability that you indeed are hypertensive is like what? 0.95. So that's that's the crux of the idea in testing of hypothesis. I'm not going to talk about it, but you can realize that you can do the same thing here. If I say that new balls are an advantage to the server, what do I do? Okay, let me let me look at data. Let me look at situations where somebody balls uh, bowls with a new ball, and let's see who wins that point in tennis. Let me compare. So let me have a hypothesis like new balls do not get you an advantage. And let me see how many times you do get an advantage and how many times you don't. And if the times that you do get an advantage is very high, then uh, there is a sufficiently high probability that you indeed do get an advantage. So this is a book written by you know, two or two mathematicians who claim they don't know tennis and they're worried that tennis players won't know maths, but that's, that's the problem, right? There's too much specialization. So really mathematicians should learn something else and the others should learn a bit of mathematics. Okay, the final example here is from football and it's the idea of XG. This is a new idea. It's, it's probably less than a couple of years old or maybe three, four years old. I found some papers in 2015, 2016. Okay, what is G? You might guess that it's a goal. Yeah, it is indeed a goal. Now you win a football match when you score more goals than your opponent. It's a draw if you, if it's goalless or both score the equal number of goals, you know all that. The point is, how do I judge teams? You know, you can have a football match in which, uh, let's say, the team I support actually had nine shots at the goal, uh, but the goalkeeper had a great day and he saved all of them. And the opposing team, you know, just luckily, streakily managed to push one and uh, eluded the goalkeeper and they won the match 1-0. So the record books show that, uh, you know, the weaker team won the match. In, and that's all that matters. But in reality, actually, the better team had played better. So what I do with XG is the following. Uh, if you can see that picture, I know it's not too big, but it's all right. It's Every time you take a shot at goal, okay, if you know football, you know what I'm talking about. You take a shot at goal. Uh, it doesn't matter who takes it. The point is really that if a, if a good player from that position on the field, with that arrangement of the defenders, with that position of the goalkeeper and so on, uh, is likely to take a shot at the goal. What is the chance that it will go inside the goal? Which means what is the chance that it defeats the defense and defeats the goalkeeper? 
Now you agree that if you are very close to the goal and you just have the goalkeeper to defend, you know the chance that you will get a goal is almost one. The probability of getting that is almost one. Whereas you know from the center yard line, if you just take one booming shot and the ball goes really up and then curls down at the last minute into a top right corner and uh, falls into the goal, you know that's a very rare event. So the probability of that could have been a lot less. So xG is really the number of times you take a shot at the goal. it may become a goal or it may not but that shot on the average in the long term would have fetched you a goal let's say seven times out of 100 or seven times out of 10 so then you say that the probability that it would have been a goal is 0.7 eventually it's either zero or one because either it goes into the goal or it doesn't but at the point where he was taking the shot the chance that it could be a goal was 0.7 all right so let's look at all those shots at goal Oh, this shot at point seven. This shot at point two. This shot at point zero five. Look at all of those, and then just add them up, and that is what gives you xG. So xG is the expected number of goals that, from the position that you were in the match, you are expected to score. Expected average number of goals that you are expected to score. Of course, with these point twos and point threes, it may add up to two point seven, but that's all right. It's not a real goal. It's just a measure of the performance of the team. so in the first example i gave maybe the team the good team actually had an xg of let's say 5.4 and the bad team had an xg of 0.3 you got one lucky goal and these guys were unlucky every time so if you compare 5.4 with 0.3 in a normal match or statistically speaking if you were to play that match hundreds and thousands of times the stronger team would have won by say five goals to nil okay so that's the idea so i hope i've given you a at least some idea and an introduction about how mathematical modeling is indeed used in sport let me also say the following it's going to be used more and more there's no doubt about it because as more and more money gets into sport and money will get into sports as more and more of sports gets onto television gets onto online systems gets onto becomes part of betting strategies see you see it's it's, it's whole empire it's a whole empire of uh, mathematical modeling so this is going to be very important and uh, yeah some of you will like this stuff and if you're young enough i do believe that you might have careers actually in this mathematical modeling in sport at the moment the demand isn't great uh, because people are still not willing to pay money for that you know for the last 20 years i write columns about player performance on websites will read it some people read it nobody pays me for it that's because i think they don't attach that kind of value but tomorrow if i'm you know if, if it's a crucial match and i desperately it's like let's say it's a life and death question for a patient for a hospital patient uh, you would pay a large sum of money to get an assessment of what is the chance of survival wouldn't you so when it becomes you know sort of so frantic so desperate then you will see that there is more demand and the market is growing the market is growing all the time people just don't want to see a match like that you look at old cricket telecast you know with just the commentator talking it's it's still a tv thing but it's no fun you're not seeing the scores you're not seeing deep plays you're not seeing you know slow motion stuff uh, you're not seeing expressions on the face it's no fun at all you try and see some cricket matches in the 1990s painful okay so now i've paid my tribute to the other sports so let's get on to cricket okay uh, this is a picture i don't know how many of you know what the picture is it's a photograph on the left i i suppose some of the seniors amongst you might know or some of the great cricket enthusiasts might know which is that picture who is that batsman he is looking at his bail that has just been dislodged the wicket keeper and look at that wicket keeper i mean you know if it was a rishabh pant or tom pain the guy would have been jumping and screaming he is just standing there and he is watching and it does look as if he's a little sad about the whole thing Uh, well there was reason to be sad because this was donald bradman playing his last test innings as he entered to bat his overall aggregate was 6996 and this would be 70th innings so as soon as he would score four runs 6996 would become 7000 and this would be 70th innings so you divide that by that and you get 100 Uh, which would have meant that the batting average of don bradman forever and ever 
would have been 100. But he got out for a duck. He was bowled first ball by someone called Hollies. And that's a picture of the Don looking at his dislodged bail. And the wicketkeeper is sad because the great Bradman, of course, he must be an Englishman, so he can't be so sad. Uh, but he's kind of sad that the great Bradman is going to walk away for the last time. I don't think anyone is a statistician. I don't think anyone has yet realized that this is going to cause Don Bradman's test average to be 99.94. It'll never be 100. It could never become 100. Okay, what you see on the right is the cricket scoreboard. I don't know if some of you play cricket in your in college or as kids. Have you seen this cricket scorecard like that? Some of you might have, but I can't get an answer from you right now because we are online. But th there's a question about that, so which I'm going to ask. What's wrong with this score sheet? If you look at it on the top, you've got this batsman and you know you're writing one, two, three, one, two, four, one, etc. So every time he scores a run, you're marking it against the name. And at the bottom, you have bowlers. So every bowler after he bowls a ball, if it's a dot ball, in fact, that's why it's called a dot ball. You wonder why it's called a dot ball because on the score sheet that you see there, they put a dot. So they put a dot, so it's a dot ball. So it enters as a dot ball. If there are three runs scored against the bowler, let's say the bowler is Kumle and let's say the batsman is Tendulkar. So if Tendulkar hits Kumle for three runs, in the Tendulkar column among batsmen on top, there would be a three written somewhere. And in the bowler column where next to Anil Kumle's name, there would be a three written there as one of the six balls that he bowled in that over went for three runs. Okay, so let me look at the scoreboard. What do I know? At that point of time, Tendulkar, you know, Tendulkar scored three. I also know that Kumle conceded three. But if I'm looking at the scoreboard, you know, three hours later or three weeks later, or three hours later, three days later, whatever it is, I know Tendulkar scored three. I know Kumle was hit for three, but who hit Kumle for three? Or who did Tendulkar hit for three? You know, who was the bowler? Who was the batsman? The difficulty with the scorecard is that it is not joining the bowler to the batsman. It tells you the batsman scored three runs. It tells you the bowler conceded three runs. But it doesn't tell you which was the batsman who scored those three runs off the bowler. And that's the problem with these score sheets. And that is why, you know, cricket analytics wasn't great in the past. And that went on happening till we had electronic scoring systems. If some of you have learned uh, you know, databases, this, was a, this is now a database approach. In a, in a relational database, if you heard about that, in a relational database, you know you join things. You're looking at the relations between the different variables. Relational databases take care of those relationships. And in fact, they run queries based on these relationships. Uh, but to be able to do that, you must establish that relationship in the first place, like the relationship between the batsman and the bowler. And if it's not established, it's not a database system, then your queries are not so good. Incidentally, again, if I talk of databases, I'm sure some of you realize that it's pure maths underneath. The whole database design, the whole database theory is based on set theory. It's really based on set operations that you all probably heard of A and B are two sets. What is A union B? What is A intersection B? What is A complement? What is A union B whole complement? Uh, you know, you all those things, you must have learned about them. That's set theory. That's, that's really what we do in relational databases. Any query in a relational database, SQL query as you might call it, is, you know, you look behind that query, there is set theory. And it's really Boolean operators, you know, a combination of, it's Boolean algebra. It's a combination of Boolean operands with sets, uh, which are formulating that query. Okay, so the big change came when we moved from lists, as the scoreboard used to show, onto databases. Okay, how do we rank teams? How do we rank teams? Now, there are ranking schemes, and in fact, uh, yeah, they keep changing the ranking schemes. There is an official ranking scheme for, you know, tests and ODIs and T20s, ICC has an official ranking scheme. I don't think it's good at all. I don't think it's really good. Lately for test batches, they've started with another funny ranking scheme, which is a test cricket championship or something like that. I think the rule is that every time you win a test match, you get 60 points. Uh, if you draw, you know, there's some, I've, I've forgotten the pointing thing, but you can easily read it up. The trouble with that is, you see how, how do we decide which is a better team? Here are a couple of bubbles that I've put through. Take a look at those bubbles. 
I agree that I'm a better team if I win more matches. Yeah, you would you agree? Of course you would agree. I mean, if you don't win anything, how can you be a good team? Would you agree that you become better if you defeat stronger teams? Without a doubt. I mean, you defeat Australia at Melbourne. That's, you know, Australia, You let's call them over to Bangalore. Bangalore has got a pretty good pitch. Uh, let's, let's call them over to, say, Pirosha Kotla in Delhi. I don't think any Australian team can defeat us. We have fought. So, okay, that was the next point, actually. So, a win is a win, but if you defeat stronger teams, it's much better. If you win by higher margins, it's much better. If you win more recent matches, it's better. You see, I'm trying to find out who is the best team right now. So if some team, let me go on. I, I, we'll answer the questions at the end as far as possible. So I want to know who's the best team currently, you know, at this point of time, beginning of 2021. So if I won a lot of matches in 2017, Today, it doesn't tell you the story, right? So I should win more recent matches. I should not sneak through the series. I should win series convincingly. But most of all, I should win away matches. So if you see the bubbles that I've put together and now you're realizing that the bubbles are not all of the same size, well, there's a reason for that. In my judgment, the biggest bubble is the most prominent criterion for deciding how good a team is or how high should the team's rank be. So winning away matches is, I think, the biggest achievement. And defeating stronger teams is almost as big. So if you defeat a strong team like Australia in Australia, uh, you should agree that it's, it's a formidable achievement. Now, unfortunately, the ICC ranking schemes don't take that. I mean, they do take into account uh, whether you're indirectly, whether you're taking defeating stronger teams or not, but they do not consider the win away matches or the home versus away difference. Why don't they consider? Simply because they don't have sufficiently good modelers. I mean, I'm sorry, that, that's the only reasonable answer. And why don't they have sufficiently good modelers when some of us right in this class can think of good ideas? The reason is that ICC was largely, but be careful when you talk online because who knows who sees this recording six months later. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that if you depend on one solitary scientist sitting in the next room in your office, it's not the same thing. Ideally, you know, there should be a worldwide contest about how should we rank teams. Let's all participate. Let's have judges to decide which submission is the best. Now, that would be a better way. Rather than just asking, you know, the statistician in the room next to yours, hey, tell me how do I rank teams? And then he finds that when he tries to do his mathematical modeling, somehow he cannot incorporate the factor about winning home matches versus winning away matches. So he doesn't include that in his model. And because it doesn't include, and we agree that it's really the most formidable reason, this ranking scheme is not going to be that good. Instead, it's fairly easy to think of better schemes. Uh, to be honest, some of us 15, 20 years ago had thought of uh, better schemes. If you search around, say, rediff.com, you search rediff, search with my name, you'll probably find it. Okay. And the key idea, the key idea, and that's really, that's really what I should be talking about more. The, the key idea is that you should be not, you should be looking at the idea of weighted averages. Now, all of us know what's an average. What's an average? I've got five numbers. I want to know what's the average. Add them and divide by five, right? Okay, let's look at your exam scenario. Let's take a very simple example of a weighted average. Let's say for every course, you've got two exams. Let's say you've got one exam in the middle of the semester. And let's say you've got a final exam at the end of the semester. Uh, now let's quickly look at an example where in the middle of the semester marks were 80 and the final marks are 60. So what's your average? 80 plus 60 by 270. Let's look at the other case. In the middle of the semester, your mark was 60. In the final, your mark was 80. What's the average? 60 plus 80 by 2, 70. But is it right? I mean, don't you think it's more creditable to have one scored more, perform better in the annual exam rather than the midterm exam? If nothing, the Syllabus is much shorter. The exam is not so rigorous. So in an easier exam, if you get more marks, and if in a harder exam, you get less marks, obviously that's not as good as getting higher marks in a harder exam and lower marks in a easier exam. I mean, higher marks, you know what I'm saying. Okay, so how do I capture that? How do I capture this requirement? The way I capture this requirement is by using the idea of weighted averages. It's a very simple idea. 
is just that instead of taking okay let me just start, instead of taking x1 let's say i just have two values x1 and x2 the average will be x1 plus x2 by 2 that's a simple average that's the average that all of you think you know but what is x1 plus x2 by 2 it is half into x1 plus half into x2 so i can think of it as x1 with a weight of half or 0.5 and x2 with a weight of 0.5. And I have the requirement that half plus half should add up to one. The weights should always add up to one. So as long as I am faithful to that requirement, I can really average any other way. So let me decide that I might give only 0.3 to the you know, midterm exam. And let me say I give 0.7 weightage to the final exam. So if x1 are my marks in the first exam, it's 0.3 times x1 plus 0.7 times x2. And that's going to give you a new weighted average. If you look at your example, go back and look at it. I mean, it's trivial. It's in this scheme, you'll find that if you get 80 in the final exam and 60 in the smaller exam, it's a lot better, it's lots more rewarding than the other. And that's the idea of weighted averages. And you know, you can use weighted averages again and again. Uh, in fact, uh, practically a lot of you, I don't know, but when you grow up and you'll get all these market research reports, you'll have, you know, great analysts, you know, giving their verdict. You look inside the reports, you look at the mathematical model inside the reports, and uh, you, you find that they're basically doing weighted averages very often. Uh, their skill involves in choosing the right weight. I mean, why did I choose 0 0.3, 0 0.7? I could as well have chosen 0 0.4, 0 0.6, or 0 0.8, 0 0.2. You, you realize what my choice of weight should be. So that is a real thing that matters, but weighted averages are a far more informative statistic than simple averages, okay? And any any scheme that, any modeling scheme that wants to rank teams more realistically, more accurately, must use weighted averages. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Who is the best test player right now? You know, you have these test player rankings, you read the papers, you read the ticker board on news, you read it on the websites. Uh, you might have read that Kane Williamson is now the best you know, hit two double centuries against Pakistan. So I might say, you know, sitting at home in New Zealand in your own pitch and against a weakened or demoralized Pakistani attack, how, how hard is it to hit two double centuries? Could Ken Williamson had, have hit those double centuries, you know, playing in Mumbai and Bangalore against Ashwin and Jadeja and indeed Bumrah? It might be different, but you know, uh, nothing against Ken Williamson. I think he's a splendid batsman. I actually think he deserves to be there. But the numbers that you read in the papers are Kane Williamson. These are latest numbers. Incidentally, last night, you know, I stayed awake and went to all those sites and made sure I give you the latest numbers. So currently, Kane Williamson is 890. Virat Kohli is 879. Steve Smith is 877. You're seeing these numbers. What do these numbers mean? Okay, the, it tells you that the higher the number, the better you are. Agreed. It also tells you, it doesn't quite tell you, but you can guess looking at the numbers that the upper limit is kind of 1,000. How did you get 8, 890? What were the factors? Okay, so what I talked about in the previous slide, a little bit of that is done, but they will not tell you the formula. You go and ask ICC, of course, ICC will never reply. Uh, but you ask anyone, how do you compute this? Nobody tells you. Why? It's not so complicated. Finally, it's only weighted averages. It's simple data analysis, trivial model, if you like. But why don't they tell you? Because uh, you know, they make money by not telling you. And they have the authority because ICC says that the rank, I can come up with rankings, you can come up with your rankings. Who's going to look at them? They're going to say, who are you? Oh, you say, I'm a great mathematician. Okay, but why should I trust you? So why should I trust ICC? Because they are official. You see, that's the difference. So how does ICC do it? They never tell you, but uh, you know, look, reading between the lines, uh, here are some things that we're sure they're doing. Essentially what they do is they look at your simple batting average. You know, the batting average that is computed traditionally, total number of runs scored divided by total number of times you got out. So that's why, you know, sometimes you stay not out, your average goes up. Because when you say not out, those runs are added to the numerator, but they're not, you know, sort of brought down in the denominator. So you have that, you always have that ratio problem. And in fact, yeah, maybe not today, but if, if you look at the COVID case fatality rates, you know, you have the same problem here. 
because in a COVID case fatality rate, you know, the numerator is how many guys tested positive, the denominator is the total number of guys tested. Now, if you are testing, you know, very few people, or if you're testing a large number of people, you realize that the average is going to change. So you can't really trust that average unless you say what was the extent of testing. I mean, just to take a simple example, is your testing random? I hope you I mean, I, the idea of random is that anyone has an equal chance of being tested. Is your testing random or is it symptomatic? Now, suppose I'm only testing someone, as used to happen in Karnataka, you know, especially in April, May, June, you know, I just test someone who shows symptoms. So when someone who shows symptoms is tested, the chance that he is going to test positive is much more. And that would tell you probably that you know, there are far more cases, but what's your denominator? Your denominator are the only guys who are already suspected to be infected and not the entire population. But okay, you get an idea. You get an idea that even something like averaging is not as trivial as it seems because you've got to be mindful of what's in the numerator and what's in the denominator. All right, so once you get an average and sometimes you realize that, okay, my average is not so good. My average is not great. For example, if you go back to this COVID testing example, I say that, you know, I'm only testing guys who are, I'm only testing people who are showing symptoms. And that's why my percentage of fraction is going to be large. So I have to somehow reduce that fraction to get a realistic estimate. So I have to say, okay, yeah, I mean, it's large, it's not so large because a large number of people are not being, who, who don't have it are not tested. So you don't know that they are not tested and you don't know that they don't have COVID. So then what you do is you typically look at that ratio and then multiply it by a factor. If you think that that ratio should actually be smaller than what it is, you know, multiply it by a number lower than one. So it becomes smaller. If you think it should be higher, multiply it by. So that's what they are doing here. So they look at the average runs and then they choose a factor to scale it up or scale it down. You can read that at the bottom. And then, so it's a bit like, okay, my batting average right now is, uh, okay. Hanuma Vihar is batting average right now is, I think it's about 34. But you say that Hanuma Vihar is always there when the team needs him the most. And when he's playing in Australia, facing Australia's best bowlers, and in a situation where the runs are crucial. So look at, look at those factors below. Higher weight for quality of opposition, whether you're out or not out, the level of run scoring. You know, if it's a low scoring match, everyone is going to score low runs. And the result, did it impact the result? So in a sense, you do it as follows. You look at the average and you say that, okay, this average is made up of what? Are there a lot of cheap hundreds in this average? You know, on the fifth day of a match, when the match is already drawn, and the wicket keepers are removing their pads and coming on to bowl. You hit them for fours and sixes. You know, that, that's, those are not real runs. You can't give it the same weightage as, you know, hitting straight drive to what? Cummins in the first over of a test match. Okay. So you've got to scale up or scale down the averages, choosing some factors. And that's what they do. That's what ICC is doing. I know that. But what other factors? They kind of tell you a little bit. And what are the scale up factors? That they don't tell you. It's all right. You got the idea. We are not worried about what the actual values are. The whole objective is to make sure that you people are enlightened about what is the underlying mathematical model. Okay. So this, this is how you do it. You start off with the simple average that the whole world understands. And then you say, well, you know, I got to, I got to jig it. I got to fix it. I got to tune it. I got to tweak with it. I got to tinker with it. I got to do a little bit of something to make it more realistic. And the skill is all in what is that little bit of something and how do you do it? And all that is really based on weighted averages. Okay, let's get on to the next. Okay, so this, this is, how do we rate who is the best ODI player? Okay, listen to this carefully a little bit because I, ICC does it as well, but they don't do it quite as well. I really think we do a better job. I mean, I'm, I'm not bragging. It's just that if someone does something so badly, anyone else who tries something, it will get a little better. So this this slide, you know, I, I, it would have been wonderful to have a blackboard and you know, write, describe this, but it's not difficult. It's not difficult. So you just stay with me, because I'm going to define something called the most valuable player index. If you look at that chart, if you look at that table that you see. Okay, you're looking at the table. You're seeing Hardik Pandya. Uh, runs, runs, and at the end, you're seeing something called MVPI. Now, MVPI is what is called the most valuable 
player index. Okay, so I, I really need to take a minute or two to explain to you how we compute this MVPI. Uh, the idea is clear, most valuable player index, you know what it means, a player who has the greatest impact, who's most influential, uh, who's most responsible for you to win the match. Now, when the IPL started, let me tell that story because I mean, it's, it, it, it's a true story and I mean, it's nothing fantastic about it. When the IPL started in 2008, a very respected, uh, you know, the paper called Economic Times. You know, you've heard of Economic Times. The interest in IPL shot up. You know, people didn't realize because before that we had something called the ICL. You know, people used to see it, but suddenly IPL was marketed so well, branded so well, the telecast was so good, the coverage was so good. Newspapers were talking about it all the time. So there was a heightened interest. And suddenly people started saying, all right, so who's the most valuable player in the IPL? The analyst in the Economic Times decided he would try a shot at that. So he was trying some kind of averaging, but eventually he said, okay, the most valuable batsman is someone. The most valuable bowler is someone. The most valuable batsman, yes. The most valuable bowler, yes. What about the most valuable player? Why don't we talk of players? Why don't we talk of players who play the role of batting, the role of bowling and the role of fielding? Why don't we talk of them together? Why don't we have an index that takes care of all of that? Very simple, it's not easy. What would you do for best batsman? You look at the number of runs he scored, you look at the strike rate probably, and uh, look at the average and you say, okay, this is the best guy, best batsman. A bowler, you probably look at the number of wickets that he took, you probably look at his economy rate, how many runs did he concede? And then whoever has the lowest, you know, you come up with some index, which really rewards more wickets and a higher economy index. All right, so that's a bowlers, you know, that's a way to measure bowlers. That's a, we have a way to measure batsmen, but what about bowlers and batsmen put together? What do we do about all rounders? The crux of the matter is, that when you look at batsmen, you're looking at runs and strike rates. When you look at bowlers, you're looking at wickets and economy rates, and somehow it's not quite easy. It's not easy to bring it down to the same base index. That's the problem. That's the key problem. If I want to have one list which includes bowlers and batsmen, as you can see this list, we do have, well, Hardik Pandya is on top because he really played, and this is, this is incidentally the computation for the year 2020 to 2021, the season 2020 to 2021. And you can see that only three matches because we had no cricket at all. So these, this is really all the ODI cricket that India has played in this season, which essentially means what we played against Australia. Uh, you know, Hadik Pandya played very well in that, although he didn't bowl. So really in this case, he's only a batsman. So you have Pandya and Kohli, and then Jadeja is taking wickets and he's a batsman. All right, so you're seeing that this is one list. And you're seeing those MVPIs and Pandya was one and Kohli was two. So how do we compute them? I'm going to give you an approximate idea because uh, it's not difficult, but I'm going to just give you an approximate idea. Let's say a batsman has scored a certain number of runs. Let's say someone has scored hundred runs. And the question I'm going to ask is hundred is fine. Okay, let's say, okay, in a three, three, three series, I mean, three match series, let's say someone scores 250 runs. I say 250 is wonderful because in an ODI, 250 means you're averaging, you know what, well over 80. The other question to ask is, yeah, he scored 250, but how many balls did he take to score 250? If to score that 250, he used up 300 balls. Not so good because his strike rate was not so good. If in today ODI games, people are on the average scoring 300 in their 50 hours. That means on the average, you expect a run to be scored off every ball in ODIs. So a batsman scores 250 runs, but uses 300 balls. He's going below the rate. He should have scored at least 300 runs and 300 balls to be average, to be at par. If he has scored less, then he's below par. So you might think he scored a lot of runs in a test cricket scenario that is creditable, but in an ODI it is not because he wasted balls. On the other hand, if he has scored his 250 runs in just 150 balls, that's wonderful. Okay, so what do we do? Basically, we look at runs and then we kind of scale it up or scale it down. Most people do is that they look at runs and they multiply it by the strike rate. So if you've got a strike rate of 140, uh, you, whatever is your score into 
1.4 and that is your rating and therefore if you go at a low strike rate you know you're going to be multiplied by a factor below 1 and that's going to bring it down so this is a multiplicative model you take the total number of runs and multiply it by the strike rate now what we did and what we did and you know trouble with multiplicative models sometimes is that you know when you're multiplying things zoom up and zoom down but the multiplication is a much more sensitive operation it tends to sort of uh, it tends to get more excited so we didn't want that kind of excitement because it might distort the results a little bit but at the same time if you scored at a higher rate i have to give you some advantage right so what i really do and that's what we are doing for a batsman is okay i'm going to look at how many runs he scored and i'm going to look at his strike rate and i'm going to convert if he's got a strike rate over 100 over the par strike rate then i'm going to give him bonus runs so whatever is a fraction extra in other words if we had we were supposed to score 100 runs in 100 balls and if we actually ended up scoring 140 runs in 100 balls then that 40 extra that he scored over the par rate is the bonus that i give him i could have a penalty as well i could have a negative bonus if he scored below the par rate so i look at his actual runs and either add or subtract the bonus or the penalty and then i get a new number and that is what i call his batting points now let's say i'm assuming that in an odi match i need to make that assumption at the beginning so i'm making a, an assumption that it's going to be average score in these odi matches is going to be 300 which means yeah the strike rate should be 100 and therefore you must score at a run a ball what about the bowlers the bowlers are allowed uh, 10 overs and if 10 overs means how many 60 balls so in 60 balls the bowlers are allowed to you know on the average you'll expect them to concede what 10 60 balls and you are allowed to concede a run a ball so he'll concede in 10 overs he'll concede 60 runs 60 runs is par so if he concedes less than 60 he's actually bowled better if he concedes more than 60 he is actually bowled worse so i look at that difference and that is one way that the bowler pitches in and also he gets wickets so whenever he gets a wicket now let's say that you score you know the par score is 300 now it's not always that 10 wickets fall but you know let's assume that every time you get a wicket it's like you scored 300 runs okay so now you see we are getting there we are getting there i'm looking at a batsman what are the total number of runs he scored but to that i either add or subtract the strike rate at which he scored them so he gets i get uh, i get what i may call his batting points for a bowler i do the same thing you know he was supposed to give away 60 runs but if he gave away less than 60 runs then i give him that benefit you know because he gained that many runs for the team if he gave away more than 60 runs i deduct that from because he gave away that much more than he was and for every wicket i give him 30 runs and for a fielding point it's rather easy you save a boundary which would have gone for four and you save it and it's just bring it down to one run so then you have saved three runs so what have i done what i've done is that i've brought this bowling batting and fielding fielding that in at other times you think is not easy to compare i brought it down to the same index i brought it down to a base index and which i call the run equivalent and that run equivalent is exactly how do i get the run equivalent well i look at his batting points and i add up his batting bowling and fielding points and that's say in a sense hardik pandya in those three matches as a bowler as a batsman and as a fielder contributed 267 runs so they are not runs of the bat but they are an equivalent of 267 runs yeah obviously if you take a catch then we give you points as well so we you sort of come up with some and incidentally believe me this is practically the same formula that all these fantasy cricket teams use again they'll not tell you their formula i won't be surprised if some of them are using exactly this formula but we've been talking about this formula for the last 15 20 years okay so you get it uh, well that's why really i'm using up a lot of time but that's what it is the most valuable player index tells you in terms of a single ent- single variable called run equivalent it tells you how much you're contributing okay now let me go on to the next this is another index name that we d- devised we call it the paisa vasool index you know nowadays it's very fashionable to mix hindi and english and more than half the you know 60 70% of cricket fans are hindi speaking so you must that's why the hindi commentary has more eyeballs than english commentary so paisa vasool index essentially uh, we talk about it in a t20 criterion 
and essentially we say how much value is the player providing and if it's t20 if it's ipl or if it's franchise cricket we're telling you how much value is he providing okay so uh, i have to speed up now but the idea is very clear right uh, okay these were dollars because of some old stuff i pulled out from 2008 uh, but but let's look at uh, let's look at say someone like uh, i actually did recently an assessment of how much they get let's say someone like virat kohli gets actually he gets 17 crores for an ipl 17 crores of rupees Uh, but let's assume that he gets 14 crores of rupees okay and let's assume that you know as rcb you know they never ever enter the finals so really virat kohli is going to get about 14 crores for play- playing 14 matches so in other words he's getting a crore per match that's what the franchise owner pays him what can he give back so you know it's very easy to think of an index saying that for every rupee that i paid you or you know every rupee is too small uh, but for every let's talk of dollars but in the sense of currency so okay the other way actually so i have defined to you what is mbpi that is the most valuable player index which are actually like run equivalent so let me have in the numerator for the ipl season let me have the amount of rupees that i gave virat kohli in the denominator let me have his mvpi for the entire ipl so mvpi for the first match mvpi for the second match so i keep adding up so if he plays all 14 matches as he would unless he's injured so mvpi in some sense is what he is giving the team what is his contribution right in the numerator is what the franchise owner pays him so if i divide the money paid to him divide, so that by his mvpi what i get is for every run that he scores and not run with the bat but a run equivalent for every mvpi that he scores how much does he get paid you will find that the numbers are astronomical i mean if virat kohli scores one run in an ipl that's going to be more than your when you get jobs and whatever is your cost to company that's going to be more than what you will earn after working for 3 years in a good company just to score one run in an ipl so now you realize you realize what big money there is in ipl and that big money is because you know there's great sponsorship so if some of you are close cricket followers and if you are reading about what tim payne the australian captain and wicket keeper was telling ashwin he was sledging him and saying oh no i ipl team wants you wait a minute you are playing a test match it's a, it's a crucial close test match why are you talking about ipl money you are because it's so much in the mind of every cricketer and eventually if i'm a franchise owner i want to know okay i paid this guy so much what did i get out of him that's the paisa vasool index right if i'm a franchise owner what would i like most i would like to pay him as little as possible and get as much as possible out of him right so that's exactly what it is but to know how much the player is contributing i use the mvpi and to know how much the franchise owner is paying i have the exact amount and incidentally now it's all available in the public domain you want to know how much rohit sharma gets paid by mumbai indians look up you'll find it it's all in the open it's on the net so the paisa vasool index in some sense is the numerator is the money paid and if it's midway you know i can calculate it at any point after seven matches i've uh, out of 14 i paid him half of the money you should assume that i paid him half of the money and he's delivered half of the performance so that of the total so at any point i can look at the ratio of how much cumulative money received divided by cumulative mvpi contributed and that ratio gives you the paisa vasool index now here's an intriguing question uh, it's just like you know i mean you look at sabra Gang- ganguly i hope he recovers quickly i don't think he'll bat again or run again too much uh, but let's say kolkata knight riders sabra ganguly even if, if he plays badly Eden Gardens fills up when they know that their dada is playing in Eden. Sarav doesn't have to do anything. So Shahrukh Khan, even if he doesn't perform based on this cricketing criterion, Shahrukh Khan and Juhi Chawla, whoever else owns KKR, they say dada is bringing me money other ways. That is making sure Eden Gardens gets full, and then I've got the gate money, and finally I'm in it for money. So if he's going to bring me a lot of money, I'm happy to share a part of that money with him. even if he doesn't bat so well so all i'm trying to tell you is that there's a limitation in the paisa vasool index in the following way 
that you're not looking, you're only looking at performance. You also have to look at the brand value. You've got to look at the excitement potential. I mean, you see, Rishabh Pan comes out the bat. You're going to watch TV more avidly. Uh, when, okay, I'm sad to say it, but if Pujara or Vihari are batting, you don't want to see it so much because he's, he's not going to hit those fours and sixes. So this is what I mean by the excitement potential. And in a mathematical model that you, you know, you ask me, I'm a mathematician. You tell me, how much should I pay this person? Give me a mathematical model that tells me how much is the worth of this player. So you realize that the worth of a player is largely based on his performance, but not only on his performance. It's on also based on, you know, what's his brand value? What's his excitement potential? And these are variables that are hard to quantify. They are harder to model. And that's why a modeler is more difficult. But you accept that these are real variables. Incidentally, if you're watching IPL or if you're watching cricket all the time, it can't be a coincidence that every time, when, let's say, Kohli is batting, all the TV ads on Kohli show up exactly when he's batting. If Kohli hits, you know, a six and a four, you can be sure that in the break between overs, you're only going to see Kohli ads. You see, this is again, this is again modeling in a certain sense. You know, you're modeling to make sure that your ad for which you're paying a lot of money gets the best possible impact from the viewer. And that impact will translate into better business for the company. You realize it's, it's you know, mathematical modeling is not just differential equations, partial differential equations, stuff like that. Uh, it's much more, but it's still mathematical modeling. Okay, here's the last one before I get on to, you know, what I, I realize I've used up a lot of time, but it's okay. We're still having good fun talking. Okay. Are you seeing these pictures? Yeah, th these were actually from the 2007 World Cup for the, and they're called Chernoff Faces. If you haven't looked up Chernoff Faces, maybe it's a good time to look up. At the end of this class, you might want to Google and check what it is. But let me tell you right away what it is, a little bit. You see, what happens with multivariate data? What, what happens, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to use statistical, language. what happens with a lot of data if you've got a, you know, too many variables that are influencing an outcome? You want to know, you know, if I give you a big spreadsheet with full of numbers and I say, okay, now this is the company performance of, you know, 29 companies based on 27 parameters. And can you take a look and can you tell me which is the best company, best performing company? And you say, wait a minute, you know, there's so much data, <laughs> you've got to give me some time. And even if I, okay, you give me some time, even if I analyze that person says, no, no, your analysis is too complicated. I, I need a minute for you to tell me. In one minute, tell me what's the position. Can you give me an executive summary? And all these big shots talk like that. Sometimes they talk like that to show off, uh, but very often they talk like that because they don't have that kind of time. Okay, so what we can do actually, and what we've done in this, and it's interesting is that, okay, now you look at some faces. Let's, let's look at faces. If you look at a face now quickly, you just stare a little bit at it. You'll see the nose is a kind of a triangle, but you realize that some triangles are, you know, very steep. Look at Muttaya Murlidharan, for example, second row, last column. He's got a huge nose. In reality, he might not have such a big nose. But I think what I've done is I've matched that nose to let's say his economy rate. Or maybe I've matched it to his wicket taking ability. And you look at his ears, huge ears. Look at Glenn McGrath. Huge years. But that's because I think I've matched the years to the number of wickets they've taken, or I don't know which one. Uh, but so that's what we do. We take a standard face and then we say, if he's taken a lot of wickets, make the years bigger. If he's had a great economy rate, make the nose steeper. If he scored a lot of runs, make his face rounder. If he scored a lot of runs at a very good strike rate, make his smile wider. Okay, you get the idea, you get the idea. So you see Matthew Hayden, for example, those were his days, 2007 World Cup. You know, nice round face, that means he scored a lot of runs and uh, yeah, wide smile because he's scoring them at a high strike rate. Uh, incidentally, also the eyebrows on top, you know, you see that they're different. We had mapped, I think, the eyebrows to fielding capability. Okay, it's not important what you do, but what happens now is at a glance, at a glance, you get a good idea about how, who's good, who's bad, and who's good at what. So you look at Muttaya Murlidharan and Glenn McGraw, for example, in this. And you say, some, I, don't know what, I don't know who these two guys are. I don't know what they do. But there's something similar about them. The data is telling you that. I mean, just, just 
data as depicted from these pictures. Now, so why they similar? Because they've got more elliptical faces. Because they've got uh, you know round, bigger ears. Okay, in a sense, it's telling you that they are very similar, and they are similar, right? They were wicket-taking bowlers with a very good economy rate. Okay, look at Ricky pointing down. He's also smiling a lot. Great batsman. He looks quite similar to Matthew Hayden. Uh, incidentally, those numbers below tell you what was the MVPI. what were the actual runs scored what was their strike rate what were their wickets so you see there's a lot of information that i'm packing into a picture and that is what uh, chern of faces do and uh, this because you know we were dabbling with statistical uh, software we found this so we did that for the 2007 world cup nobody noticed it too much some people did in 2008 i read an article in the new york times exactly the same chern of faces and they are evaluating the performance of baseball coaches and they used chern of faces and of course new york times said this is the first time that anyone in sport has used chern of faces now i knew truthfully and had proof on the website that we had used it in 2007 it doesn't matter it's not important it's not really important but you got to be careful i think the lesson for all you young students and indeed young faculty is that it's not enough to go do good work it's equally important to make sure that the world knows that you're doing good if you are first in the race you should get photographed it's important of course yeah there's the other problem you can tell a lot of lies you can say you're great when you're not okay uh, some other time okay here here's another one before i i promise to talk about that the question is the following you know often people say people say the following some of you are probably young the younger students they say you know whenever there is a crisis sachin tendulkar fails it was very common whenever there is a crisis sachin tendulkar fails now the truth of the matter was that there was a crisis because he failed you see the difference he failed the crisis is caused by tendulkar's failure it is not tendulkar that causes the crisis i mean it's a failure if there is a crisis you get what i'm saying you see it's, this is conditional probability you tend to get confused all the time but uh, you get the hang of it if people are saying that every time there is a crisis sachin fails a more correct answer could be that every time he has failed there has been a crisis uh, which is more realistic so these are examples of conditional probability in fact what i've written down there you don't have to worry about it but that's really the full form of what is called the bayes theorem that we use in conditional probability in a conditional probability it is a bit like in a simple probability so what is the probability of some event happening in a conditional probability you say what is the probability of some event happening given that something else is happened yesterday you could say what is the probability that india will win given that rishabh pant is batting 97 in 112 balls the moment he got out that probability of india winning changed suddenly it became lower so really when we talk when you estimate the likelihood of winning or losing these are not unconditional probabilities these are conditional probabilities when i say something is likely to happen at the back of my mind i'm thinking of two three other things that are contributing to this event and then i'm computing the probability so basically that's what bayes theorem does let me give you one more example of conditional probability which is quite important in say today's covid era suppose you have suppose you test positive for covid do you have covid fair question to ask on the other hand if you have covid will you always test positive so this is you know this is very important in clinical trials and people this is often called the specificity or the sensitivity of uh, i'm going not going to talk about that but let me just alert you about the following what we know about this covid test that exists so far is that if you test positive you're quite likely to have it but if you test negative you may still have it so that's what we'll talk about false negatives and that that is why we had that great controversy about you know rtp rtp i mean rt pcr test versus the normal other test you know which have a one test is able to detect 
infection much better than the other. Okay, so we realize that time can fly as it is flying right now. Okay, so let me come now to the crux of it. I would have liked to have a much larger discussion on this, but I realize that I'm running out of time. But uh, yeah, that's okay. So normally at this point, I pose the question to the class: Do you know what is the Duckworth-Lewis method? And somebody says yes. Somebody says no. Somebody says no. I look at him. I say, "What? You don't know what the Duckworth-Lewis says?" If they say yes, I say, "Yeah, okay. Tell me what is Duckworth-Lewis method. Let's see what you know." And then they sort of feel tense in a class. You know, you've been students, you've been teachers. You know how it happens in a classroom. So I say, "All right. Tell me what the Duckworth-Lewis." So then they get a little nervous. They say, "You know, it's something to do with when it rains. You know, you've got to do something about it. It's something true. I'm not sure, sir, but it's something about rain." And then they'll say, say "It does. It works well, or it doesn't work well." That's again based on their. All right, so you must. So you, let me ask you the question. I'm not going to get an answer, but look at this scenario. Let's say it's an ODI match, and India bat first, and they are 300 for two in 50 overs. And let's say Pakistan come out to bat, and they are 151 for nine at the end of 25 overs. And at that point, it begins to rain horribly. It rains so much that the field is wet. The match is abandoned. but this is an odi match and we need a result so who won so till the quote lois came on that was around 2000 we used to look at only what is called the run rate so if you look at this number india scored their 300 runs in 50 overs which means on an average scored 6 runs per ball uh, six runs i mean on an average scored 6 runs per over i look at pakistan score at the end of the 25th over they were 150 which means their average was slightly above 6 and if you're only looking at the run rate to decide who wins which is what they were doing which is what they were doing in odi cricket till 1999 or so till over till 1990 or so so what happens pakistan is declared a winner because their net their run rate was fractionally above india's but they were 151 for 9 it was just one ball needed and they would be all out for 151 and india would have won by 149 runs so how fair is it how fair is it that just because of one ball so what was the problem what went wrong why did we get this ridiculous thing the answer is very simple because you thought that you have to only look at the overs or basically you thought that the decision has to be based only on the number of balls that were bowled that was a mistake the real answer is it's not only dependent on how many balls or how many overs were bowled it also depends on how many wickets were lost see today in today's match let's say you're chasing 300 for 2 and then you come out you know you know that you and you know at the beginning that you're only going to get 20 overs or 25 overs to play what will you tell your batsman go out and hit hit 3 sixes and get out if you get me 18 runs in 8 or 9 balls it's very good because i have 10 wickets to use up in 25 overs so wickets are in some sense not so valuable runs are more valuable okay so really the question you need to ask is if i want to win i need some resources anything you know if i want to succeed in life i need resources resources can be like how much money do i got uh, you know how rich am i what kind of education do i have you know you can talk about whatever you like but these are resources so these are uh, these are the intangibles uh, that give you power that resources yeah so the message there therefore is that in an odi match you don't have only the resource about if you have more balls in your pocket then you're more likely to win okay that's true but that's not only true what's also true is that in one pocket you must have a lot of balls to play and in the other pocket you must have a lot of wickets to bat so in some sense it is a combination of two resources and that is what should decide who wins that odi match or eventually the t20 match okay there's a chart below you know but i'm not going to talk about that because i it was a method that they tried in the 1992 world cup which was not successful in fact it led to some bad results india would have defeated australia in one match but for this stupid result no stupid rule but all i'm saying is that there were a lot of stupid rules till the court lois came up 
And what did Dakot Lewis say? They said that your fundamental error is that you must take into account the fact that, okay, I'm moving on to the next slide. Uh, you must take into account the fact that when you are chasing, when you're playing an ODI match, when you're coming out to chase a target, what are the trump cards? What are the resources that you have in your pocket? You have two resources. You have how many wickets are you holding on to and how fast or how many runs have you scored? So what does Duckworth Lewis do? Duckworth Lewis comes up with a mathematical model, truly a mathematical model that combines these two resources. Okay. So in some sense, I've got two variables and then I'm sort of, uh, I have a model to join those two variables using some intelligent method. And therefore those two variables I combine into one variable and that variable is dependent on the number of, on the state of the match. Okay, so that's what Duckworth Lewis is. Are you seeing those charts? Yeah, okay, there's an umpire who's, okay, this was a joke. I mean, generally, you know, it's not so difficult at all, but uh, you know, people like to exaggerate a lot. They think that even simple match is tough. So the cartoon is some umpire struggling with Duckworth Lewis. And uh, yeah, so he seems to be wearing too many hats. But of course, later now it's all on the scoreboard or he can get it on his display. There's no difficulty. There's an old slide. Uh, but uh, let's look at that graph because that we are doing, it's a mathematical modeling lecture, right? So we need to look at those graphs. So what am I seeing there? What's Every time you see a graph, the most important and the first thing that you need to do is to see what's on the x-axis and what's on the y-axis. And the next thing that you've got to do is you've got to see what is the scaling. Because very often people fool you with graphs by manipulating what they show on by the range on the y-axis or the range on the x-axis. Basically what they'll do is they'll only take parts of the x-axis and parts of the y-axis and it's like zooming up this graph and only showing you a part of the graph that is exciting or positive for your benefit. Okay, but this is a true graph and let's look at it now. So what do we have here? On the x-axis, we've got what I call overs remaining. You can think of it as balls remaining. So on the x-axis, it's overs. You as, might as well think of it as balls. So 300, 299, 298, 297. As you go from the origin to the right side along the x-axis, that those are what your values are going to be. 300 balls remaining, 299 balls remaining, and so on, so on. And towards the end at the extreme right corner, there are zero balls remaining. Uh, which means if you don't have any balls, you can't score any runs and therefore your resources are gone. Okay, what's on the y-axis? My y-axis has the combined resources. And in this case, it's combining it on the basis of how many balls they have and how many wickets they have. So let's look at the topmost graph, okay? Let's look at the topmost graph, which is kind of purple, I think, right at the top left corner. Uh, it starts with 100 when Balls remaining are 300. What does it say? It just says the innings has just started. Not a single ball has been bowled. So the batting side has all its 10 batsmen and it has all its 50 overs to bat. So at the moment, the resources, that the team that is going to bat or going to chase is 100%. It has full resources. It has 100% resource. That's what it's showing. Now look at the trajectory of that graph. What happens? As soon as you, okay, let, let's look at the graph at 40 overs stage. What has happened now? Let's look at the topmost curve. Now, starting from 100, it has come down to something like 90. So what is it saying? It is saying that the side that is chasing the target, it started off having 100% resources. That means it had everything that it wanted. But now that 10 overs are gone, it has depleted. It has used up some of its resource. See, I get a lot of money at the beginning of the month as my salary, but then I pay my rent and then I pay my EMIs and I pay this. So all, if my salary is my resource, it gets depleted when I start spending. So in a cricket environment, it gets depleted because you know I've used up, I've used up 10 overs. So part of my salary, if you like, or a part of my resource I've used up. So what does it say? If you look at the topmost line, it is saying that at approximately 40 overs, the resource is something like 90%. Okay, clear. I'm sure it's clear. Okay, now what do I have next? I have a sort of light blue line, then I've got a yellow line, then I've got a very faint something line. So all these are curves. And these curves are based on wickets in hand. Okay, so let's start. Let's start a journey. Let's start, you know, we are, we are, we are starting our chase. 
it's an ODI match that all of us are playing. We are starting our chase. At the beginning, we are at the top right corner. We've got 100% resource. The first ball, maybe I score some runs. I'm not looking at what runs I scored here in this table. All I'm saying is, as soon as I play one ball, my resource came down by a bit because in the, I had 300 balls. Now I have only 299 balls. I play another few balls and my resource is coming down because my ability to score runs is getting lower and lower because the balls that I need to score these runs are getting lower and lower. And then what happens? A wicket falls. As soon as a wicket falls, you had 10 batsmen to start with. Now you only have nine. So your resource kind of drops down a little faster. It's not very gradual, like losing a ball. Suddenly it drop, drops down. So that's what happens. So if you're an ant and if you think that you're at the top and you're traveling along the topmost curve, as soon as a wicket falls, tuck, you come vertically below to the next curve. And that next curve is nine wickets in hand. And then second wicket falls and you come below. So you look at a funny situation where, let's say, seven wickets have fallen in the first 10 overs. So what is the resource? You, okay, look at this. So therefore, overs remaining is still 40. So look at that vertical line, but look at the seven, the blue curve at the bottom. Now that is at something like, uh, what, 27, 28%. You still have 40 overs, but you only have three batsmen. So a lot of overs, but not enough batsmen. And therefore, the resource that is left with you, the, your ability to score runs is now down to something like 20, 28%. You appreciate the fact now that really for a side to win, you must have a lot of wickets in hand and you must have a lot of resources in hand. And those are the graphs. And those graphs are from a exponential DK model. So you've got E raised to something and it's a DK model. So you're constantly and uniformly going down over time. Because one requirement for a resource is after every ball, the resource must go down by a little bit. It can't, I can't have a few balls where the resource doesn't go down and the resource actually goes up because that's ridiculous. And that is where the mathematical rigor comes in. The, the exponential curves are such that they are always uniformly going down. Okay, so that's what you have there. And indeed, that table, that graph that you see, I can translate it into a table below. If this is a condensed table, but normally I can have a table for every ball. It's very easy, right? All I have to do is suppose I've got 300 balls, and I've got I just for I just plot. I, know I just look at points on the graph. In fact, I go back to the original points that helped you make the graph. Okay, so let's just look at this table. At the, let's look at 25 and 60 and two wickets. So wickets lost are two and overs are 25, which means it's something like, let's say you're 100 for two at the 25th over. 100 for two after 25th over, you may be chasing something. What does it mean? It means that you still have 61.8% of your resources. That means at the end of 25 overs and after having lost two wickets, you have only used up, what, how much is it? 100 minus 61.8, let's assume that was 62. So you still have, you, you have still have about 62% of your resource and you've used up only 38% of your resource so far. You have much more resource at that stage when 25 overs are over, but you have lost only two wickets. You still have 60, 62% of your resource. That means you've used up only 38% of whatever it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, it is actually 38% of your resource. And if you have more resource, it means you can score more runs, right? So the larger the resource I have, the greater is my capability of scoring runs. Okay. All right. So let's take a simple example. I mean, I hope you're following, but I have to assume that you're following. So let's say at the 25 hour mark, let's say you are 100 for two and you've used up 62, uh, you have used, you still have 62% of the resource. Well, 62% is roughly, let's say two thirds of your resource. So at the 25 hour mark, if you're 100 for two and you still have about two thirds of your resource, that means you've used only one third of your resource and you use that one third of your resource to score 100 runs. So in the remaining two third, I should be able to double the runs. So my prediction at that point would be that you're probably going to score 300 runs at the end of the match. Okay. Okay, let's see what the next slide says. Oh, it's already 11.30, too bad.
Okay, so, okay, I, I'm going to finish first. The, 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 key, the key, key idea here, well, we started 10 minutes late, right? So I do have 10 minutes. Okay, so, so the key idea here is that the amount of resource that you have with you tells you what is your potential of scoring more runs, okay? Now let's imagine a situation where you were chasing 350. And let's say that you are 100 for two at the 25 over mark when it rains and the match is abandoned. You were chasing 350, so who wins? So by the little the explanation that I gave you, if at 100, if you're 100 for two at the 25 over stage having lost two wickets, we think that you can score 300 runs. We think that at that stage, you were on road to score 300 runs. But your target was 350. So you lose the match. You lose the match by how much? By 52 runs. If on the other hand, you were chasing only 250 and you are at 100 for two at the 25th over mark, then you really had the potential to score 300 runs when you are only required to score 250, which means that you would have won the match. Okay, so that is the idea of a par score. The idea of a par score, and listen to this carefully because that is key. The idea of a par score is that at this point, if the match stops, who's going to win? That's the question. And the answer is at this point when the match stops, the Duckworth-Lewis method says that your score should have been so much. Have you scored more than that or less than that? If you scored more than that, you win. If you scored less than that, you lose. And by how much do you lose? By how much you scored less. Okay, so that is the idea of a par score. The par score is, if the match stops now, what was the score to draw? What was the score for two sides to be equal? And if I even scored one run more than that, I win. Okay. Okay, so one moment. Okay, I'll go back to that slide, but because I think this slide explains things better. So you look at this, you know, just look at, I talked to you about number one, look at the runs, then consider them. Okay, that forget the two, because that is, I jumped that. And then three, there are two resources, overs and wickets, the idea of parity of resources. That's what I just talked about just now. What is a par score? And then, okay, uh, things like that. Okay. Maybe I have to come back one, one other day and talk to you, but let me just go on to something that is, uh, that is somewhat more interesting to me right now. And that is about what happens in a T20 match. Because in a T20 match also we have rain interruptions. In a T20 match also we are required to make sure that we have a result. So what do we do? How do we use, see Duckworth-Lewis with the underlying mathematical equation based on an exponential decay function and you know, lots of things. There's also a model for fall of wickets, you know, okay, it's pretty complicated, but it is a mathematical model. It's a rigorous mathematical model. They came up with a set of curves, okay, which I showed you. They essentially came up with these curves. Now the point is, what happens in a T20 match? In a T20 match, Basically, you only have, it's like you only have the last 20 hours. You can think of a T20 match as a match that started out as an ODI match. But before the first ball was bowled, there was rain or there was some interruption and only match was reduced to 20 hours a side. You can pretend that an ODI match, you can pretend that a T20 match is like an ODI match with the first 30 hours lost. Okay, so the first 30 hours are lost. What does it mean in terms of Duckworth Lewis? It just means that, you know, if you look at this graph, if you look at this graph, you know, all this part up to this is all gone. Everything to the left of this line is sort of lost in rain. And the rules are based on what is on the right of that line. Okay, which is that. And now one of the troubles with that line, if you look at, uh, if you can see my cursor, you know, at the five over stage, the lines are joining. That really means I don't care anymore about wickets and balls, all that matters is runs. Okay, so let, let me now go on to the, 
So if you look at this graph on the left, that is the graph of 50 hours truncated to 20 hours. Okay. Let, let me move on because the, the key idea I want to tell you is that Duckworth Lewis thinks that it works in T20 and they say our method is fine. Our method is fine. All you got to do is you got to pretend that the first 30 hours were never played. Now the major submission and that I mean, I stick my neck out to it is that is not true. The dynamics of a T20 match are very different. A T20 match is not a truncated ODI with 30 hours lost. If from the beginning you know it's a T20 match, your playing strategies are different. If your playing strategies are different, if not the model, the parameters and the variables that go into that model must have different values. You cannot use the same parametric values that work for an ODI match for a T20 match. And Duckworth Lewis, now Duckworth Lewis turn, pretend that it is the same. Captains protest, people don't like it, but what can you do? ICC says that this is our rule. Okay, so that is the crux of the matter and that is very sad. So I'm going to sort of keep jumping slides a little bit now. Okay, so let, let's look at this slide. Two equations really tell the whole story. Okay, what does the Duckworth Lewis assume? So look at my first blog about really. Duckworth Lewis assumes that your only resources are wickets and balls, which is scoring weights. Okay, that is true. That is true. It was better than just looking at balls. It's better to look at a combined resource of wickets and balls. But are these the only two things that decide? Well, the Duckworth Lewis mathematical model thinks that these are the only two things that decide. What about dew? What about a wet ball? You've seen IPL. You know, if there's a dew, people can't hit because the ball doesn't come up. And then when Dhoni swings his bat, it ball would have gone for a six. He'll either get caught or he'll mistime it completely or he'll just lose it, get bold. What about a dusty pitch where the bounce is not good? What about short boundaries? What about balls not coming on the bat? You see, if you look at IPL matches, and we've all looked at enough IPL matches, the score can be very different, you know, on, on a one kind of a ground, like our Chinnaswamy Stadium in Bangalore. You think you can score 200 runs every time? 200 is a kind of a par score. That's why you got Kohli and De Villiers and Gales, and, you know, you try to pack your team with batsmen. You just say that we have so many batsmen, and on this pitch we can score so many runs that our opponent can't do much about it. And that's why when you go to Sharjah or somewhere, you can't play. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the eventual verdict of what happens in a match, there are not just two factors, there are many, many more factors. And it's very hard for a mathematical model to incorporate all these factors. You know what happens in a mathematical model is, you know, you try to be rigorous, precise, it's wonderful. Uh, but as more and more variables come in, you make more and more compromises. And the modelers, especially, you know, there's, there's a divide now. They say, no, the mathematical model is sacrosanct. A mathematical model is next to God. So if I were God, I'd say, oh, really? Is that true? You see, in the past, when we didn't have enough data, we used to trust the mathematical model a great deal. Now, today what's happening is that there is so much data. There is so much data. In the past, you know, I had to go searching for data. Today, data is coming to search for me. It's saying, please take me, please use me, please employ me, please exploit me. And that's what people are realizing. I mean, you, you see all the fun that's happening on WhatsApp, you know, people wanting to go to Signal or something. They're worried about data privacy. I'm not sure there is reason to worry because finally every online fellow will sell the data because that's how they make their money. I mean, a great product like WhatsApp or indeed Gmail or indeed uh, Wiki, they give you free. Somebody has to pay for that. They have to earn their money to provide that quality of a service. And they earn their money by selling your data. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a little hypocritical to say, I'm going to use all your great applications, but uh, you can't use my data. Well, that's how it is. Obviously, you can't abuse your data. It, it can't intrude your privacy. If someone knows that, you know, okay, I don't want to go into those stories, but uh, privacy is important. Uh, you, need a, you need a mix between those two things, really. And therefore, when I have a lot of data, the whole game changes, the whole game changes. And I have much more freedom. And really models after a point become weaker because models by their mathematical rigor that is expected of a model become very limiting. 
if it has to be mathematically valid and it still has to be a model then it becomes a very complicated model and may not be a realistic model in the past it was still better because data was so little today data is so much that it's it's a different story that's why it's data driven so if you see the my designation i'm supposed to be a scientist at the fourth paradigm institute the fourth paradigm is a data driven and that's what's going to happen you're seeing it all over and all of you youngsters when you work for a career you're going to be doing less of this kind of classical mathematical models with a lot of math in it you're still going to have mathematical models but they are going to be very much more data intensive so i really believe that uh, the current dls model for t20s is not just not good it's bad one day we will have to come up with a better model and a better model will largely depend on more variables which are now available with more data okay now all i'm going to do is i'm just going to scroll through my rest of my slides okay there was a great idea about pressure index maybe i can just explain i told you at any point of time remember i told you that what is a par score i said that if the match stops now based on the duckworth lewis method who's winning and who's losing and i said that if your score is more than the par score then you're winning if your score is less than the par score then you're losing if your score is exactly the par score of course you'll round it off and so on uh, then it's a draw so let me try to define a index based on that so i saw that if my chase score while chasing is exactly the par score i'm facing a 100 a pressure of index of 100 if by pressure and if i am actually below the par score i feel more pressure right because i have to score more runs in the future otherwise i'm going to lose the match so if my score is below the par score i see that my pressure index is more than 100 if my score is higher than the par score i see that my pressure index is lower than 100 because i'm feeling less pressure so this is the idea of a pressure index that we devised it's actually just the par score divided by the actual score and it gives you a good indicator of who's winning the match at this point so the match may not be abandoned it will continue but i still want to know at this point who's winning suppose you are in a class and you know your teacher says switch off your phones and all that kind of thing it's a 2 hour class you know a 1 hour class and then you come out and you ask your friend hey what's the score and if that fellow says oh 129 for 3 that's not enough you first want to know how many wickets and you want to know how many overs are bowled and then you want you ask three or four questions that allow you to decide who's going to win in your mind So the idea of a pressure index was that I'll tell you one number. If that number is more than hundred, then the side that is chasing is losing. If that number is below hundred, then the side that is chasing is winning. You know that was the idea of a pressure index. But we were depending on the Duckworth-Lewis method for the pressure index. So tomorrow, Sir Duckworth-Lewis will say, "Hey, you guys, you cheated our farm." So what we tried to do, and this is what uh, my friend I talked briefly, Karandikar, director of. Chennai Mathematical Institute. We came up with an idea equivalent of a pressure index called the pulse. We look at variable, look at a different kinds of variables. You know, we look at uh, how many dot balls are there. We look at how many boundaries were there. We look at we look at a lot of things. And incidentally, this is the way the big data is going to go ahead. If you are watching the IPL, people would have kept on talking about matchups. They will say, for example, that. if rohit sharma is batting if it's a swinging left handed uh, bowler who's bringing the ball into his pads rohit sharma is vulnerable what do they mean by that how did they decide that because if they look at past data and they say how often rohit sharma got out and they see how often it was a left arm bowler and they see how often was his score you know zero and what state of the match so they look at they just count basically and they say in this kind of a scenario rohit sharma is more likely to get out So if Rohit Sharma is facing, and you have a chance to have either Stark bowling or Nathan Lyon bowling, Lyon bowling in a ODI match or T20 match, let's Stark bowl because the matchups are saying that Rohit Sharma is more more vulnerable. How do I get the matchups? I get the matchups based on a lot of straightforward big data analysis. Okay, the last thing, you know, okay, I'm I'm going to stop after this, so organizers don't have to worry. the point is you know what is happening we we are now going through this you know for a long time india said i don't like drs and then when virat kohli became the captain he said yeah i like drs so on so on but really you know one of the questions i've always had is why only two trials 
people say, oh, if there are no two trials, you know, match gets slow, momentum is lost. I say, I don't agree. Because even if I get an extra minute to be really sure if Virat Kohli was out or not, I don't mind that. And who minds it? The advertisers don't mind it either because all the money now doesn't come from what you earn in the stadium, from the gates. It all comes from TV revenues. Okay. And of course, lately there's been a lot of this discussion about what you call the umpire's call. It's very funny. So, okay, you know these things. You know, what you're seeing here is a typical uh, DRS. What happens when a DRS is taken? The picture below, you see what is called the hot spot. Okay, it's really touched the back. So, if there's an appeal for an LPW, no, he's not out. And sometimes a hot spot doesn't work because it needs all that infrared stuff. So, you look at a snickometer. And if the video says that at that point there's a spike in the snickometer, then, and there could be, you know, the bat is away from the pad and so on. So, it's very sure that if you heard a sound, that sound has to be from a bat hitting ball. So, you know, these are all DRS techniques. And in DRS, we still have the ridiculous situation of an umpire's call. You might argue that, you know, even if it hits a corner of a stump, like how Bumrah got Steve Smith out in the earlier test, it just sort of touched his bail, out of bail. But he was out because the bail fell. So if the ball had, that ball which was going to knock his bail down and hit his pads, he probably would have been not given out LBW. Because at the end, it would have been umpire's call because umpire is not sure. So why do you have an umpire's call? Fair question to ask. A reasonable answer is that the accuracy of the modeling prediction is not so good so far. You know, when the model thinks that it's just touching the wicket, it could be that it's just failing to touch the wicket. The model is not so accurate. It can't get it so right. So then you have a silly rule like if it's touching 50% of the wicket, then the model must have got it right. So that's why you have the umpire score. So then what do you do? Where do you stop? At 50%? So then they say, if it's a close decision, let's go back to the umpire and say what he thought. Because he too is a judge. I mean, just like uh, DRS is a kind of judge and umpire is a judge too. But do we really need an umpire? I think we don't. I think that in future, an umpire is going to become like a traffic constable. Because already now the no ball has been taken away from the umpire, which is a good thing because half the guys are bowling no balls and getting an advantage. Or, you know, like uh, Josh Butler, they were running halfway down the pitch. Needed an Ashwin to tell him, you know, to better behave, otherwise I'll get you run out. The fact is now we already have a third umpire who looks after the no ball issue. So increasingly you're seeing that many of the roles that a traditional umpire had to do on field in real time. Long ago, you know, run outs were taken away from the umpire. He just can't see it because you have to run and be aligned. He can't see it or even if he sees it, he's likely to get it wrong. With direct hits, so often we realize that it would have been run out when the eye thinks that he's not out. Okay, so run out, the umpire is gone. Now no balls, the umpire is gone. One of these days, you actually won't need an umpire. And I'm saying that let's have DRS every time. Let's have DRS every time. Let's make sure that, some, uh, let's improve the model. Let's make sure that somebody who's supposed to win wins. I mean, somebody who's really not out should be not out. Somebody who's really out should be out. Once again, you know, we're talking of Errors of the first kind, errors of the second kind. We're talking of the specificity or the sensitivity of the results. True for as much for COVID infections as for cricket results. Okay, so I'll jump this. This last one, or maybe there's another one. Okay. You know, you have to talk a little bit about... So do you think there is match fixing? I'll end with that. Well, there isn't match fixing anymore. I mean, I, because people have realized it's too, you, you're caught too easily with match fixing. But you know, cricket is a game with a lot of variables. Whenever there is a predominance of variables, there are greater and greater opportunities to bet. I could bet, for example, that the first 50 will come in the 52nd ball. There's a certain probability that it happens. That probability is low enough for some betting agency to give you high stakes on that. Now, is this going to influence your result? Not really. Even if the batsman is trying to fix and he's been told that the first 50 should come in the 52nd ball, then, you know, if he's he'll, if he's heading for a 50 in the 47th ball itself, he'll say, okay, let me play a few dot balls and let me make sure that I cross 50 only in the 52nd ball. To that extent, he may be fixing, but nothing more than that. Match fixing, you're caught. And once you're caught, the penalties are too high. 
and uh, if you're banned for three years, imagine if you're an active cricketer, you're banned for three years. In IPL lingo, that means that you've lost 20 to 50 crores, which is 10 times the lifetime earnings of you know practically any Indian sportsman. So people have realized, at least the rich cricketers have realized that they shouldn't fix big time. No match fixing. Don't get so greedy. But greed is always there. So some people will probably be doing something like this. Somebody has bet first 50 will come in the 52nd. Where do you think Bumrah will land the next ball? Is it going to be a yorker? Is it going to be a bouncer? People betting in thousands and lakhs of rupees on that. Somebody says that, you know, you accidentally bowl one. You think you pretend that the ball slipped your hand, but there was a bet that it was going to be a beam. Okay, so a little bit of that. How are we going to fix it? Today you can't fix it, but tomorrow with you know, when you have so much data coming in, you're going to have machine learning models, you're going to have you know, machine learning models leading to AI kind of models, and you're going to be able to get pretty good answers about this suspicion. So I still can't say that this man fixed it, but I can say that with a probability of more than 0.95, he probably fixed it, okay? All right, so here is the last slide. So how is the future looking? How is the future of modeling in sport or more specifically the modeling in cricket looking. I'm saying that machine assisted, I'm talking of an intriguing, intriguing concept called machine assisted winning. What that means is that today you go out and play an ODI match. I'm saying don't even play a match. At every point, you know, if based on these matchups and things like that, as Bumrah is walking back to ball, you know, he get, he gets a whisper somewhere saying, next ball, you should bowl like that. Because this batsman is this batsman and is most often going to be out like that. So strategies to win uh, will become sort of on a ball by ball basis. DRS will learn better. Models will get better. The, the Duckworth Lewis method will become a sort of learning as you go. I mean, why should I have a fixed model that doesn't change? Every time there is new information coming in, my model will suitably change its parameters a little bit. I expect tomorrow's resource tables to evolve genetically using some genetic algorithm. And more than anything else, there are great opportunities in gaming. Look at the IPL sponsors this time. We didn't have all those Chinese fellows who sold smartphones, you know, Vivos and Oppos and all that. They backed out because of political reasons. So who came in? Match 11. All the cricket gaming teams invested crores and crores of rupees on sponsoring it. There's a story there. Okay, so with that, I stop. I hope you heard me carefully. Uh, well, it was... Uh... Yeah, if you have some questions and if the organizers yes, allow yes, it, yes, sir. We, we I, I will answer them. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. It was really a wonderful and uh, interesting talk. And I think we have some questions. We'll take some. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Deshmukh, sir, uh, has one question. Is the DLS formula readjusted if the batting order is changed? Surely the available resources not only must consider how many wickets are remaining, but which batsmen are yet to play? And then, is, okay, let me answer. Oh, he's got one more question. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, okay, are Chernoff faces inspired by uh, okay, uh, this okay. Fenman diagrams in any ways? Sorry? So, are this Chernoff faces inspired by this Feynman diagrams in any ways? Okay, answer to the second question first. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I have just heard of Chernoff is a Russian sounding name. And it is a tool that software in statistical software, you know, offering solutions and multivariate statistics they use it. So I don't know if who inspired Chernoff. So truthful answer, I don't know. Uh, the first question was about uh, batting in the, in the Duckworth-Lewis method. Does it take care of batsmen? Yes, sir. Uh, the question was that if you rotate the batting order, what happens to the Duckworth-Lewis targets or formula? Well, there again, again, because it's a mathematical model and because you have requirements of you know uniform, decay, and so on, what the model assumes is that the first six batsmen are the same quality. And the last five 
batsmen or really more bowlers than batsmen are often inferior quality so the model assumes that the first six wickets are more valuable than the last five wickets so in that sense they accommodate but uh, permuting a batsman of course if you are permuting a batsman who's would have batted at number 3 and is batting at number 5 today it doesn't matter because in this model you are assuming that the top 6 have the same ability thank you sir one more question here students are asking what's the difference between this white ball and a pink ball in the cricket okay the i mean all right so i don't think i have a great answer but i can well first of all there's a little bit of the key idea is that people don't come to see test matches daytime test matches nobody watches so the thing is people are working they are not so interested or they either to come to the ground or to watch it on tv so they say if we play it in the evening and night and we now all grounds have got good lighting maybe it helps so they are just hoping for a better viewership and not only in the ground but much more on tvs and they thought that if the matches are played evening right night rather than morning afternoon it might help but as soon as it's a night And then what happens is that the batsman has to spot the ball. So if it is pitch dark at nights, a white ball is easiest to spot. If it's sort of twilight, then they decided that maybe a pink ball was better. I think it's a marketing gimmick. It's a little bit of a marketing gimmick because it's neither day nor night, so it can't be either red or white. So they make it pink. But again, what happens is the color. There is good. These are basically leather balls. So there is good technology to make red balls and white balls. Uh, they don't quite have that technology to make pink balls you might just say what's a color it's just not a color difference there's a little more to that so pink balls are known to be swinging a little more and they are much easier for a bowler than a batsman yeah so a pink okay. ball is more bowler friendly okay. because it also it could be that it is it does un, unexpected things because you've not faced enough of it so the batsmen still don't know how to face a pink ball as well as they know how to face a red ball or a white ball over time either pink balls will disappear or people will get used to batting yeah so there is one more question uh, is it possible to predict a match outcome or at least vaguely predict uh, the likely outcomes solely on the mathematical models well okay now you know the spirit behind all these mathematical models is that they are internally doing averaging the mathematical models that are built indeed the duckworth lewis mathematical model is always looking at the average number of runs that a team might score you know, its openers might score the average number of runs that the after one wicket is lost what will be the average number of remaining scores how do you decide when one wicket is lost how many more runs are going to be scored the only way they can do it is they look at past records for a fairly long time and they see okay after one wicket is lost how many runs were scored and then they average that and the average of those in some sense goes into the mathematical model as a parameter so the honest answer is that in a mathematical model the parameters which determine actually the calculations are based on averaging to the extent that an extreme match is quite different from an average so if you make a prediction based on a model it is a prediction based on an average evolution of the match now if there is one match that is evolving very differently then the model will not be so good thank you so much sir uh, we have completed the question answer session now we have come to the end of this uh, session and i just take 2 minutes to thank all who are uh, back and in that we support with this uh, so on behalf of the organizing committee and on my own behalf i thank our today's speaker dr shrinivas bhogle for accepting our invitation and enlightening us with his dynamic thoughts and ideas thank you so much sir okay uh, i take this opportunity to thank dsu management for the continuous support to conduct this event and it's my privilege to thank our honorable vice chancellor dr knb moti sir for always encouraging us to conduct uh, such events i would uh, i would like to thank our beloved dean sir uh, dr shrinivas for his incredible support lastly i thank all the participants and my dear students uh, and colleagues who made this event successful thank you one and all
Any any estimate of how many were how many were present? So three hundred so were there. Three hundred plus students and three hundred were watching on Zoom and uh, around twenty uh, plus students were joining. I uh, mean, watching on the YouTube. Because when you talk, you know, you want to be you you want to talk to as many people as possible. Yes, sir. That's one advantage when I don't have a live class. I can't lecture to five hundred in a class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Truly. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, sir, for enlightening us with your uh, great ideas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Have a good day. Yeah. Thanks.